A young lad who was shy, right? He was very shy, but when he got to know you, he was himself. He loved uh, the farming cows, uh, out in the tractor with his granddad. Um, and his cousins. His cousins, <laughs> he absolutely loved his cousins and uh, they were like brothers and sisters to him, right? Because he was obviously an only child. But uh, he just loved all as aspects of the outdoors. Potato picking, um, uh, just anything gardening, um, working alongside his grandpa. Uh, then as he got older, he started to grow it, grow, grow into himself. And um, he still lacked that wee bit of confidence, right? But we went back to, to, to secondary school and say, or even in the last six months, really, really had came out of himself, hadn't yeah, it? Yeah. You know, he really came out of himself, and uh, he was just loving life to the full. And I have to say, he had the most amazing summer. I think they did, yeah. They had the most amazing summer, <laughs> they, did, hadn't yes, they yes, really yes. did. What were they getting up to? Oh, well, well, I'm not too much. We <laughs> were getting up to like he had like a um, a petrol bike, right? And you'd have heard them coming from Donald Moore, right? That's Beck. And I knew we called them Hells Angels, right? Oh. But um he just loved all things, uh tractors, anything with an engine. Do you know that way? Anything at all. And uh quads, what else? No, mopeds. Mopeds. Oh yeah, they'd recently got themselves mopeds, right? So they would head off on those on a Sunday and just have the crack and just he was a typical lad. Mm. You know that way? And he loved to wind people up. Matthew, like as his friend said, right, he was there for you all the time. Any hour of the day, if you needed Matthew, you just had to pick up the phone and he was there. You know, he wore his heart in his sleeve. He would have threw his arms around and told you he loved you. Uh, he, he loved food, good food, you know. Um, just have really fond memories of out the back making pizzas and just having the crack with him and his friends and, you know. And you mentioned like his obviously they were really close to his friends and his friends were very comfortable here even, oh. even you know in the last couple of years. His friends are Paul are amazing. Well, you don't know he stint there in hospital. Was it only about? In August he had something, something viral going on anyway, and he don't know he stint in hospital. And the doctor said to tell him, "Do you have any brothers or sisters, Matthew?" And he went, "No, but I have cousins." Yeah, and that's what he thought of them, you know. <laughs> and as for his friends, girls and the boys, they're just. The support they have brought to me, they'll never know. You know, to see them brown boots sitting at, at my door, it just means everything. And I, re I really, really mean that. It means everything to me. Because I don't actually think I could have got through it without, obviously, my own family and Peter's family have been fantastic, but his wee friends are something else. Mm. And they, they don't get the recognition they deserve in life. Do you know that? People are too hard on them. Mm. They're a great bunch of kids. Um. Take me back to that night, I suppose. Um, I wonder that, if it's every worst, well, every that night, worst nightmare to get that first phone call. Well, I, I was, I was uh, putting up the Christmas tree. Um, I'm not going to say it's a job I like because it's not, right? Yeah, it's a charming mood. Well, you're having yeah. a wee glass of wine. I was, having a, stone, stone. I was having a wee Bailey's. I was putting up the Christmas tree and him and Thomas. Thomas is his, his, his cousin and his best friend and his brother, okay? And... Before they went out, uh, they both arrived in and I ironed their shirts and their jeans and I said to Matthew, get them boots off till I give them a good clean. And I looked at Thomas and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to do yours as well, right? So they got themselves all spruced up and spruced up and they were stinking of aftershave, right? And they were bouncing around the house all hyped up, you know, because they just love the country and western uh, scene. So they left here, their wee friend Molly picked them up and away they went. And then at half one in the morning, Thomas was on the alert right away that there was something wrong and Thomas just he did the, he was completely all over it mm -hmm. and we headed up there straight away mm. I knew instantly there was something seriously wrong because Matthew would have texted me to say well my um he would have had an explanation for me so I knew instantly there was something wrong when he wasn't picking up his phone and stuff right so he, he, he wasn't that type of child. He wasn't that type party. of child. We knew that. We no, knew his personality. He needed to know you, right? He would never have went to the party, right? And we went up, searched all through Fentanyl. Well, back to the house here. My niece rang me. She was fancy. There's something seriously wrong. She was then picking you up again. And we went back and we drove all around Fentanyl and all those roads. And we went to Oma and we came home. And I was half expecting to hope that he'd let himself in through the back and into the cabin at the back of the house. But he wasn't there. And I knew the next morning that there was something seriously, seriously wrong, you know. 
And from that, from nine o'clock the next morning, everybody was there. Everybody, everybody, everybody knew. There was not, there knew. was no time where we didn't feel we weren't searching for him. We were all over Oh it. no, You're roaring into hedges, you know, shouting into hedges his name. Because we thought maybe he'd be clipped back here. And he was in the ditch maybe, possibly, right? But little do we know he was in a ditch. I just obviously got disorientated and walked on. He obviously couldn't see and he was cold because he had no coat. And yeah. He had no coat and no phone. I'm traumatised and I'll be traumatised for the rest of my life. To know that it's just possibly one of the worst deaths your child couldn't, you know, to know they died alone in a ditch. It's possibly, it's just, it haunts me every night. And every day, and I'll never be the same person again in either of a bitter. It's just, you know, I've lost a huge part of me. And I've lost everything because he was everything to me, wasn't he, Paula? Yeah. <laughs> if anybody said anything. Well, you couldn't have said nothing about Matthew. You couldn't yeah, have said you nothing about Matthew, right? Me and my it? other sister always give off about our boys in the cottage because you can say nothing about Matthew to our friend. No, all. because he, he just was everything to me, you know? He was the reason why I got up in the morning. So he was. The house is empty. The house is empty. His wee friends. People don't realise the impact this has had on everybody from his aunts and his uncles to his cousins to his friends. Um, it's had a, like you know, it's caused a lot of anxiety and stress, you know. And like, I never cried for the first month. Not one, not one tear did I shed. It was numb. And then it started to flow, you know, that way. But the first month, I had no, like, heart. You know, I, 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 I don't know, it's hard to explain. You, you were numb, Francis. I was numb. Were. You don't sleep at night. You've got haunting visions of him walking around the roads in Fenton. Like, if you know Fenton, it's derelict and it's like Spaghetti Junction, right? Those thoughts haunted me. And they'll haunt me for the rest of my life. And he was only a short distance from the Actors Will Centre, which is the saddest thing. Peter was sitting there at 11 o'clock in the morning, right? So he was at that end of the lane where Matthew's body was discovered. But we never dreamt that he'd been in a ditch up a field, you know that way. And so spinning forward then to, to, to the moment itself that, that someone actually came and, and told you that, that he was found? But to be perfectly honest, I knew he was gone because that morning when I came home to let the dogs out, I went up into his bedroom and there was a wave of perfume or aftershave under my nose, right? It wasn't a sniff, it was a wave. And I know that was Matthew saying, Mum, I'm gone. When they told me, uh, I already knew, I already knew in my heart he was gone. But to hear those words, there's been a body found. Just, just your, your worst nightmare. How, how do you cope? Now, how do I cope now? Um, my family and Peter's family are fantastic. Um, Matthew's wee friends drop in all the time, passes the evening. Um, I don't go out really, okay? I, um, I, don't, I, I don't want people approaching me, basically, right? I, I don't go out and so the girls would get me stuff and or go somewhere, go somewhere where nobody knows me, but I feel very nervous. I feel safe in my bubble at home, so I found my way of protecting myself. Hmm. I suppose it's obviously still, you know, really in in in, their, in recent memory. I mean, do you ever see yourself being able to recover from from that? In um, way, shape or form? No, I don't have the space to be honest. I don't. Like I wanted grandchildren and all that. Like I packed away Matthew's farm and all his little farm animals into the attic, right? in the hope someday that he would have grandchildren. But last week I went up into the attic and took it all out and brought it over my sister's. She's five, five wee boys now, isn't she? Four wee boys. Four wee boys now, right? And I gave it all to her because they need to be played with. You know, and that's what Matthew would have wanted. Mm. So I think it was in her, like, uh, 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 maybe a herd of 400 cattle. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just keeping myself busy in the house. And just, um, yeah. And that's just my little dog here. He keeps me company, don't you? Yeah. Bestie, aren't you? Um, 
Um, Probably if it wasn't for the dogs, it wouldn't get up in the morning, to be perfectly honest. Okay.